Welcome to The X Podcast. So great to have you wherever you're tuning in from. My friends, Russ and Tim, how are you great. gentlemen doing today? I'm doing great. Yeah. Doing well. Doing great. How like your you? hat. Thanks. Did you get sleep last night? Do I look sleepy? Well, I don't know. Were you editing your book? Or? <laughs> oh. <laughs> I got a couple hours. <laughs> got a couple hours of sleep. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I did. What about you? Did you get sleep? Well, I'm quitting caffeine, so I'm like dragging. Oh, I bet my first couple days were euphoric. It was great. Hmm. I, I I really? read something really? on how bad it was for your brain. Yeah. Yeah. The I amount that. that I drink. And like, oh, oh yeah, you'll get dementia. You have fifty percent higher likelihood of getting early onset dementia than if you <laughs> like well, Was it the well, same thing me. that said cut out all caffeine and all alcohol? Uh, it, no, it didn't. Because I about, saw something about that, the effects of the brain on either one of those, even in moderate amounts, he said cut it. Yeah, I, you know, and, and who knows, you know, my, my grandpa. Smoked, so I've been doing right. Then. Right. <laughs> Not my, drinking coffee. My great grandfather, <laughs> right, you have. Uh, except for, just kidding. I was about to make an alcohol joke. <laughs> <I apologize. laughs> those, those things aren't funny. Um, <laughs> but my grandpa, he drank Natty Light every day and smoked cigars every day, every day, didn't exercise right. a lick. Yeah. And probably didn't drink any water for his whole life and he lived till he's 95 years old so i don't know how that and it didn't have dementia or nothing that's good genetics but, in favor you know, right I mean, there what does that have? but so i'm gonna yeah. give up caffeine i guess is the all caffeine point. or just coffee. Like for now for now yeah. i just i'm trying to get it Who, out how long is this gonna last can we take that well you love coffee yeah you are but a coffee there's fanatic. something about seeing it in black and white and i've recently i mean for those of you that don't know my coffee addiction is horrible it's I awful drink all day every day i Pray mean for him Eight to nine cups a day, probably. Mm. Dang. I just, it's like water. Dang. I just I have it with me all the time. Really? So I'm trying to quit. So mm. today's my first day where I'm like, oh, I am feeling it. Are you grouchy, too? I am a little grouchy. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> I'm a little grouchy. <laughs> but Someone get him some coffee. Yeah. And then it's speaking raining. Of which, and speaking of which, what do you got in that cup of there? Coffee? You this? have a pretty bad coffee addiction. But you know what's funny is um, I probably am uh Classically, not classically, technically addicted. What's the word? Class. Right. I don't know. Right. Clinically. Anyways, clinically. <laughs> that's where I'm looking for. Clinically addicted. <laughs> but I, I didn't sleep. You're right. <laughs> but I usually only drink one cup of coffee a day. Really? Today on days like today, Just only a few one hours. A day? This is my second one. No, I do like one really strong pour over one my craft apartment day? in the morning. That's it. One craft a day? Nope. No. One okay. cup. And I, then usually, we got some, we got some coffee if I do work out, some sort of like pre workout. Yeah. yeah. That's, a, that's usually the extent. Some have caffeine some don't i think the one i have right now doesn't have caffeine in it do you drink any caffeine mm -hmm. no yes <laughs> i do uh diet you know what i i really found since i i switched to like all sugar-free stuff is diet citrus tea yeah. is actually pretty good it's it's really Snapple. good so i think it has it in it no it's not by snap fruitopia you always love that what is oh yeah <laughs> um and uh but but no are I, you still I doing on yoohoo <laughs> I don't drink Yahoo. Yoohoo. Yoohoo. Yoo I don't drink Yoohoo. Okay. Chocolate milk? You mean? Yoohoo? Like, they're talking about this the old drink? Yep. Yeah, it is. No. Anyway, but. so I'll be punting to you guys on conversation. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> we'll wake you up. Yeah, it's too boring. It's like right now. Oh. Uh, anyway, go uh, we're going to have a conversation today, almost a leadership conversation. Yes. And I think it's going to be exciting. Uh, you've been working through it with the staff here yeah. at the church. Yeah. So why don't you just kind of uh, lay out what it is oh. that you've been laying out and we'll just continue to lay it out okay well to lay this out <laughs> um I'll, I'll, I'll set it up with a it was you're gonna need to lead this today it was a very <laughs> unique um yeah it was a, a unique moment where i was uh, i told our staff i was on the elliptical uh at the gym and a guy from our church was there and hopped up next to me a couple guys actually and um we're just you know we're doing our thing on the elliptical and he asked me a question that just took me by surprise. It just, you know, I was like, where did this come from? And it was a great question. Uh, it was one of those like leadership questions, I think, that it was just, I was unexpected. And he said to me, he said, well, Pastor Tim, that's what he called me. He said, um, if, uh, he said, what's one thing you wish everybody around you knew? And I, I mean, I'm just like, pause, you know, just pause. It's a like, great I'm question. Gonna, it is a great question. It's almost a great question to ask people. What's one thing you wish everybody around you knew? 
It's like whether it's your staff, your family, whatever. What's one thing that you wish everybody else knew? And I, uh, it literally kind of took me by surprise because I, I told our, our team this. I said, I don't spend most of my days thinking about wh what I wish everybody else knew. I spend most of my time thinking about what I, I need to know. <laughs> you know, what don't I know? And so it, I paused for about 10 seconds just to kind of process it and kind of go, I don't know, man, that's a tough question. What, what, what do I wish everyone knew? And then I just turned and I blurted it out to him and I said the word capacity. Hmm. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, what do you mean by that? And I said, well, the one thing that I wish everybody knew around me is that their capacity was their responsibility. That's good. Mm -hmm. That the re responsibility for what they're capable of doing and how much and what they can do and the responsibility, I guess when, what I, we began to talk about it, um, falls on their shoulders. And it's not anybody else's shoulders. Like it's a personal responsibility to increase, identify, but also to increase your capacity. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's just kind of really, like it, 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 was, it was a great conversation. And when I got done, I just started writing some notes and some thoughts about it. Um, because again, he asked me, what do I wish everybody knew? And again, it wasn't in, in any way like everybody around me just doesn't have the right capacity and you need to raise it. That's not how I feel. I, you know, it, it, to me, it's something that I have to constantly look at as, as an organizational leader that I have to realize that when our organization does not continue to progress or grow or change, that I am, I have to look at me first as the primary right. lid of the organization. Mm -hmm. And so whenever we've been stuck in the years of leading an organization, um, rather than blaming everybody else, the first thing I have to do is I have to look inward and go, okay, am I being a lid? Where am I stifling our ability? Um, you know, and so I, I, I think I, that happened to me at an early, I guess early in my venture when, when I went full time into leading a church and thought things were just gonna take off and things were gonna happen and then they didn't. Uh, I just remember months into it coming face to face with this uh, reality that, um, well, at the time, there was nobody else to blame. There was nobody else to look to because there was really no other staff. I mean, it was me and a part time administrator, you know, who was mostly handling administrative duties and bookkeeping. And it's like I was the person responsible for. It's hard to blame her for church. everything. Huh? Hard it's to blame hard her. to blame her for everything. I tried. And, uh, and so I think. I Sorry, think Joyce. I think because of yeah I think because of that that in that scenario of realizing that that it, it was on my shoulders that if this organization was going to move beyond where it was that it was completely and solely on my shoulders that I began to take responsibility for it and I had to I had to change I had to dive in I had to learn I had to expand and get better at certain things and areas mm -hmm. before this church and organization went to the next level and so I think that was, uh, that was kind of just my initial thing, was just throwing, it, throwing that, that idea of capacity out there. I don't know if we talk enough about it. Yeah. I think it's easy to go through life and not, mm -hmm. not, I think it's easy to go through life and maybe you can mm -hmm. do a good enough job in whatever field you are. But the real question is, are you actually growing mm -hmm. what, I want to say it this way, what God has given you? Mm -hmm. yeah. Are you growing your capacity? Are you increasing your lid? I just know whether you're watching this, listen to this, you know, whether it's in your career, your job, it could be parenting, it could be whatever it is. I, I just, I'm a big believer that if you're not moving forward, you are moving backwards. Mm -hmm. right. And and what does it mean to actually get better? And what mm -hmm. does it mean to increase your capacity? Mm -hmm. So that was kind of the, the primary thing. I, I'd love to know what your thoughts are in regards yeah. to capacity your capacity right. russ why do you disagree with that so much <laughs> it's just uh i'm just diametrically opposed to the whole philosophy of <laughs> getting uh, better yeah no uh i that was one of those that was hard for me not to just amen and start throwing chairs out of excitement <laughs> it was i just um i think partly because there's a really it's a it's a challenging concept but it's actually a really exciting thought um, when you realize or remind yourself in every moment that you have more ownership than you realize you have, yeah. you have more ownership yeah. of your life. Like it's, it's, it's kind of sucky to take the blame or to take responsibility, but the flip side of taking responsibility is then you're empowered to actually change. Mm -hmm. You're actually empowered to grow. You're actually empowered to say, and so not to put, 
words in your mouth, but I, I'm curious for you, like as a leader, even your motive of why you would say that, because I immediately think of two motives. Like mm -hmm. one is for the other person, mm -hmm. because the way I'm wired, like um, I know like empowerment and developing, those are like buzzwords. But yeah. I, honestly, I discovered one of the things about myself in, in my leadership about 17 years ago is that's one of the things that fires me up the most, um, whether I do it well or bad or imperfectly as I do it, like seeing other people flourish and getting yeah. the opportunity to see other people raise and whatever small part I can play in that, like is the most rewarding thing in the world. I'm, I'm imagining that's like an infinitesimal small fraction of what it's like when you parent and you see like your kids like run mm -hmm. and like you get to teach them. And, but um, to like see the people around you like flourish in their giftings and to be able to pull that potential out yeah. of them, it, it's a painful process, but it's one of the most rewarding processes. So I imagine... Um, especially if you're a passionate person and you're an optimistic yeah. person, you tend to believe there's just this. And, and if you are a person just that has a faith framework, yeah. you, you tend to just believe there's just an insane amount of potential in everybody. And it drives you crazy, f not at that person, but for that person when you see it dormant mm -hmm. or yep. dying or withering. And so there's an exciting part for that person where you want to pull out the potential. I imagine the other side of the motive for you probably as an employer is you um, you want to see people take ownership? Yeah, because I like I'll like for me. There's a there's a there's a really big difference. I think sometimes we can think, man, I'm waiting for someone uh, to extend me opportunity when really I just need to grow my capacity. Yeah, and there's a mindset shift that happens in a culture and a team and in leaders when that mindset clicks of, okay, what is on me. Like, yeah. what is on me to grow? Mm -hmm. And if I do my part, then that's going to be seen. Our opportunities are going to come as my capacity expands. Yeah. So what exactly I don't know. the question? I don't even know what that answers your well, question. Well, I have a question. I, yeah. I think that, yes, I think yes to a lot of what you guys are saying. Um, can we tease out more the definition of what you'd consider capacity to be, growing mm -hmm. your capacity? Yeah. Because in my mind, it immediately would – uh, the negative connotation would be do more things. I want to be able to sure. do, I want to do more things. And so I, I know yeah. that there's a more nuanced yeah. approach to it. So why don't we, yeah. why don't we well, dive into what, that? So one of the things that I, I gave uh, our team, I said, um, this is just, again, not exhaustive. This is just me kind of processing through my years of doing this. And what have I seen that can, that makes up someone's capacity? And I, so I gave him five factors. I said, there's five factors in my mind that help make up someone's capacity. Again, not exhaustive. I'm not an expert on this. This is just what I've seen. Um, one of them I, I said was your gifting. I think everybody has a unique makeup, a unique wiring. When I say gifting, I'm not referring to it in just, even I told him not in a spiritual context or what, you know, I'm talking about like, you know, uh, you're gifted at certain things that right. comes natural to you. It's right. just, you know, part of your personality and your wiring, your environment, your nurture, nature, all that combined has come, you know, to things that you're good at. Just right. things here, you know, I think there's a natural gifting and that we could say, if you're in a faith context, I would say that's what God gave me. That's what I have to work with. Mm -hmm. Could be intelligence, could be emotional capacity. It could be all these different things. Um, so I think gifting is one. And then I, I think skill. Mm -hmm is another uh, factor of capacity. And in, in, in my mind, what is skill? Skill is when you develop or hone your gifting. Mm -hmm. To me, that's your skill. When you, you have developed a skill, it's probably because there's something that you were gifted at doing, you went and put it to work and you actually got better at it. A great example I used in the environment we're at is I was talking about one of the guys on our team, you know, uh, Trey, who's, you know, he's a gifted musician, a gifted guitar player. I'm like, you could, I know people that are, I know my brother-in-law, he's so gifted musically, never took lessons once, picked up a guitar, and is a phenomenal lead guitar player. Now, he didn't start off that way, but you would look at somebody like that and go, that person has a natural ability. I, I could spend hours and hours, and I would never be able to play the guitar like mm -hmm. he can. You have a natural ability, but he did not start off playing like that. He developed it. Mm -hmm. So skill to me is when you actually put to work the gifting that you have been given. Uh, third factor, I said, was education. To me, what is education? Education are the tools that help you develop your gifting. Mm -hmm. the, you know, what, and education doesn't always have to be formal education. It, it can be, are you reading? 
Are you listening to podcasts? Are you, what are you, what are you taking in that is increasing your ability to do whatever? And it could be your job. It could be parenting, mm -hmm. you know? So you can sit around there. What could increase your capacity as a parent? Read some books on parenting. Read from, you know, what, what have other people who have been parenting said? So education, I think, is one. Uh, and, then I, and then I said passion. What is passion? Passion is like the energy, the amount of energy that you bring to that gifting. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, if it's something that I'm passionate about, I am going to throw myself into it. I'm going to have the energy mm -hmm. that I'm going to be. I am like, this is something I want to develop. Again, if you go back to playing an instrument, I mean, you can apply capacity to anything in your life. I want to be a better piano player. I want to be a better singer. I want to be whatever. Okay, well, you need to have the passion for it. If you don't have the passion for it, then it's, it, it's not going to go anywhere. You're not going to lift the lid. And then the last one I told him was work ethic. Mm -hmm. And I said work ethic is how hard you're willing to work mm -hmm. for it uh, and to, to build it. And so when I think about our capacity, I think it is your ability to do and again, depending on what framework you're from, in my context, I say it's my ability to do what I feel like I'm called to do or my mm -hmm. purpose. Some might want to just look at it and say, it's my ability to do my job. It's my ability to, to, to lead my home or my ability to make money or my ability to be an expert in this or to play an instrument or whatever. It doesn't matter. And so to me, that's that's the realm of capacity. Capacity, your capacity is defined by a lid. All of us have a lid. Uh, I do not have infinite time. I don't have infinite experience. I don't have infinite resource. I don't have, like, I don't put myself in that same level again in our context of believing that God is infinite. I am finite. So I, don't ha I don't have that full capacity. So I have to understand that I have natural lids Mm -hmm. to my ability to be the best at what I feel like I'm supposed to be. Mm -hmm. So if your capacity is what you can do, then would the definition of growing your capacity be what you're doing today to be able to do more tomorrow? Yeah. Not that you're doing like more, that. but that you're, um, that you're, I mean, in a way, like when you think of strength training, you're, you're, you're doing something so that tomorrow you'll be able to do more. Mm -hmm. You're yeah. growing the capacity of your muscles, the capacity of your strength. You're growing to be able to, one, like you said, to one, do more. I like that. That's a great way of putting it. The one weird analogy that I always think of, I may have shared this a couple of years ago. I, I think of when I think of capacity in a really practical way that may not have a ton of everyday use, but is uh, for anybody that's ever waited tables, you'll understand this. But when you're waiting tables, you're, you know, you start out and you're like, at least for me, I'm like, I feel nervous carrying two plates at once. Mm -hmm. And then within a month, you, you, you're, you know, when you're cleaning, you got five glasses that you got tucked under your one arm and then you're carrying three or four plates. And what's weird is um, unless I have like a ton of groceries to get at the supermarket, like I know I look really weird going through a grocery store because by habit, since I waited tables for three years, I'm just used to grabbing this, tucking this under my arm, this, and I don't even think about it. It's become second nature to be able to juggle way more than I ever could in the previous life pre-waiting. And in a weird way, it may sound cliche, like cheesy, but what I did in that season enabled me to carry more for the rest of my life in another season. Yeah. Um, Practically, professionally, when I worked in retail, um, uh, the retail place I worked at was very, they were really big on teaching leadership skills, managerial skills, like conflict skills. And I never imagined how in that season actually leaning into that and learning that would like prepare me, mm -hmm. my capacity for future roles. Mm -hmm. No, that's good. I'll say this. I, I, I want to get into when you guys first realized that you didn't have the capacity to do what you needed to do. Yeah. Because I think that like, the on paper everything that we're talking about absolutely i think if you're not violently shaking your head yes at everything that we're saying i think yeah. that you know then you need to make sure you're doing the thing that you feel like is for you because <laughs> mm -hmm. we should all want to grow in our ability to do our job well to lead our mm -hmm. families well and uh and and treat our bodies better every day that's mm -hmm. what we want to do is grow in our capacity to do all things yeah um but I think there comes a time when you realize that I don't have what it takes to get this done the way I think it needs to be done. Mm -hmm. uh, or, uh, you know, I'm parenting in a way that I, this isn't how I envisioned doing this. And so can you guys both maybe give me one real example of maybe a, a time where, where you had hit that limit and where you had, you saw that it's like, wow, I, I don't have what it takes and I need to figure it out. 
Well, one I one example that I gave to our team. So this is, uh, you know, I I was talking about when I first um, started in full time leading our church and organization, um, realizing that we were hitting a lid and it was on me. I I had to change. What's the lid? Huh? What was that lid? Uh, for us at the time, it was about a hundred people. But what what was the what was the lid like what oh yeah so well i think first the lid was my my mentality mm -hmm. my mentality at the time was that um i know how to do this that i just keep doing what i've been doing and it'll keep growing mm -hmm. that was my lid my lid was really my mentality i thought okay hey i've been doing this for three or four years i know how to do what i need to do on sunday i know what i need to do uh, you know and and it's kind of the whole you know what got you here Mm -hmm. won't get you there right it was that concept that i didn't understand mm -hmm. and so it was kind of coming to the realization of what am i missing and when i realized that i was the only one responsible i started reading books i started uh at this time this was this was years ago so there wasn't like instagram and follow that but i started kind of following uh some other organizations that were further ahead doing things and i started and they they were t they were they would literally have resources to go if you are this size, you should be doing this, this, and this. I'm like, oh, I haven't been doing this, this, and this. Right. So now I start doing this, this, and this. And I mm -hmm. started to actually do the things that they were saying to do. So I think it, for me, a lot of it, that was a mentality issue. Mm -hmm. It was, I was a lid because I was not self-aware. Right. Mm -hmm. I'd say a lack of self-awareness was my greatest lid. Yeah. yeah. Um, I can give an, another quick example of one I, I told the team. Um, when we realigned our, our organization last year doing, due to COVID and opening up new facility, and um, we were able to kind of you know, condense our, our staff and kind of put people in new roles. And I added uh, Russ to the executive team and some other things and, and had him leading down versus before I was leading kind of, but didn't, wasn't able to lead well, the different campuses, the different leaders. Um, when that happened, it freed, I, I don't know how to describe it, but there was an emotional and a, there, was, there was a capacity of margin of space in my mind that it freed me up that I was able to write a book. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't think I would have ever been able to do that if it weren't for recognizing I can't, it, so that was a capacity thing. I can't keep leading them, leading this, doing this, doing everything else I need to do and have the capacity to grow myself and go to the next level as a leader for organization. Right. And so one of the things that really I, I realized that afterwards, I started like a, a couple months after making that change, but I remember feeling different at that time of year. And I couldn't, I couldn't even put my finger on it. I was like, I don't know why, but for some reason I'm getting fresh inspiration. I'm getting ideas. Like even, you know, we do planning out in advance, whether it's for the weekends and leading up to that, I was like, I have nothing. Mm -hmm. And it was because I had no mental capacity. Mm -hmm. I, I had none. And so like for, that was a realization for me that me being involved or me having too much on my plate of doing that was actually becoming a mental capacity for me going to the next level, yeah. which is what our organization needs. And then in six months time, I was able to write a book. I yeah. want to, I want to come back to you on, on, because I think the interesting thing about a lot of organizational things is it's quantifiable, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I did this, I kind of yeah. was able to delegate this. So I, and I think it's incredible. The church was able to grow from a hundred to this, or, uh, or your, my bottom line, or my revenue, or yeah, yeah. or whatever your context is, I think is interesting. So I want to come back to you, but I'd love to hear you after we go to Russ on parenting, because mm -hmm. I feel like that is a you know you've raised two daughters, wonderful daughters, who, but you over the years as a dad, like how have you changed your capacity as yeah. a dad? But well, let's talk about. Um, I don't know if these are great examples. For some reason, the first one that pops in my mind is when I first got here. Uh, I moved here three years ago to take uh, the campus pastor role to serve one of our locations at the time, Lancaster, and it had been through some tough times, really needed two or three full-time people hired for it. And, you know, I'd been in full-time ministry a while. I trusted my gut. I'd been fortunate to be around some great leaders. But at the same time, like I had to be honest with myself, I've never actually hired an employee. And I felt, I was like, oh, man, like I don't want to go through the motions and fake this. Like I know what the heck I'm doing. Um, this is 
uh, this is something that I need to grow my capacity or at least grow my knowledge, grow my. So, you know, a couple of things I did. One is I got to, uh, I, I refused to hire anybody, I think for the, for at least a month and a half. And I got to glean from y'all's wisdom of people that have been here and ask a whole lot of questions. And then another thing I did was, um, you know, I'd for a while already subscribed to Craig Grissel's leadership podcast. He has these 10 to 15 minute at times 30 minute just leadership gold and i remember that two years prior he'd had a series of how do you interview employees mm -hmm. for future employees mm -hmm. and how do you hire and i just sat down in the office one day and i just spent two hours and i listened to all of them and i took meticulous notes and i just spent a week meditating on okay what is his wisdom when it comes to the hiring process and then i made myself wait a month and a half and actually tried to apply that wisdom right um, and so I don't know if that, that to me, that's a practical way from an educational yeah. standpoint of, because yeah. I think anytime, I think you realize how much you need to grow your capacity anytime you step into a new role or you have, I think the moment you have passion, you realize, holy cow, I need to, I need to grow my capacity. Mm -hmm. Anytime vision or passions in the equation or a new role or a new moment, you realize, oh, I immediately need to grow my capacity. So that, that was that. And then I think when I finally started, um, and actually committed to not just writing, but finishing and publishing a book. Mm -hmm. That was something, you know, I'd, I'd written my whole life, but never professionally. And uh, so again, I bought books, I bought Stephen King's classic called On Writing and read and took a ton of notes. Um, I invested and spent money to attend a, an all day seminar, Donald Miller teaching on writing. Um, I interviewed people that um, had finally been published uh, and then every step along the process, I just invited feedback from professionals and peers mm -hmm. uh, to see my blind spots. Mm -hmm. uh, because I, I knew as much as I can, you know, rest on the laurels of, well, I know writing and I know words. I'm like, no, I don't. Mm -hmm. I need every single I that uh, would be productive to have on this work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good. That is good. Let's talk about something less quantifiable in the parenting realm. Oof. That is challenging. Um, you know, because parenting feels like one of those things that you just, it, it's like walking around your house in the dark. You just keep bumping your head into something mm -hmm. and hoping that you make it on the other side. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah. Parenting, it's like, it feels like there's, there's no side. real rule book, <laughs> you know. There's no real rule book on how to do it. Yeah. Every kid is different. Mm -hmm. How you have to parent, I think that that's one of the things that um, that we, my wife and I, like, learned, um, I will say this, we, we really, I think, sought out to, to develop or increase our capacity more as they got older, especially into like the teen years. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think when, when your kids, when you have a new kid, new child, uh, you're a new parent, they're, they're new, you know, you, you're kind of make mistakes. But I will say, um, some of the things that really helped grow my capacity, our capacity was we always spent time, my wife and I always spent time with older people. Mm -hmm. I say older people, they're older than us. So, you know, we, we were, you know, if we were in our early mid twenties, we were hanging out with people that were 40 mm -hmm. and that had kids. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like we, we got to learn a lot of things from them. And I just think that that was really helpful. It was really instrumental when it comes to, you know, trying to figure out how to be a new parent and raise kids. But I remember, um, I would say in the, you know, I think a lot of it has to be the education because passion, you're going to have a passion for your kids and you're, you're going to work tirelessly to raise your kids, you know, going back through the, some of those things and you go, am I gifted to raise kids? We all have a, we all have an ability to do it. Right. I mean, you, it doesn't you know, really matter if you're it, gifted. It doesn't you matter. Do you got to do it. And, and I think, I think, you know, we've been created to have that ability. Um, I do think there's a skill to raising kids and I do think you can develop that skill. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, one of the things I remember really through education and um, we read books. So, you know, we wrestled with different seasons of it. And I remember reading books, um, you know, I, I hesitate to bring up a really ridiculous um, illustration. Um, I really do because it's, it's especially if you're outside the church context, it's really corny. But, you know, we, we grew up. Uh, I can't wait to hear it. We Maybe grew up. You'd probably know this, but we grew up, um, you know, not participating in trick or treat. <laughs> I told you this is a pretty funny illustration. 
Um, but we, we grew you up. You grew your capacity, though. We did. We grew our capacity. Some would not agree. But <laughs> we, we grew up, and it was like trick-or-treat, Halloween, you know, it was kind of the devil's day. And, you know, so it was like mm -hmm. turn off all the lights and hide uh, rather than engage with your neighbors and meet them. It's awful. It's evil. <laughs> um, and so, so I remember when we had kids and, you know, Lauren was kind of, it was like one, two, you know, we're getting to that age where it's like, okay, everybody in our neighborhood, we'd moved into a house, everybody in our neighborhood was trick or treating. All our neighbors that we had become friends with are trick or treating. It's like, what are we going to do? We handed out candy. We did that with our friends before we had kids in that neighborhood. And, um, and so we had to kind of go, what are we going to do as parents? Mm -hmm. You know, we were kind of both raised, but then we were like, is it that awful if they want to, you know, dress up like a pig or something, you know, to go around? You know, it's like, is this that, are we really worshiping the devil doing this? You know, it was, a, it was tough, difficult. And so, but I remember my wife, you know, went and got a book on it, you know, it's called Redeeming Halloween. <laughs> and like, we, she read it and she was like, here, I want you to read it. And I read it. And so what I guess to... You know, we ended up making a decision to let our kids go trick or treating, and to take them. But we had to we had to kind of inform our understanding. I, I, want, I guess let me say it this way: there are a lot of practices in our life or habits in our life that are naturally handed down to us that we sometimes never even know why or think it through mm. or do whatever. And I think that can come through in parenting. In parenting, the way you were raised, the things that your mom did, the things that your dad said, the things that can just naturally make its way into the way you parent. Mm -hmm. And so, that, again, not that it was wrong or right, but for us, we had to go through a process of really saying, what are we, how are we going to parent? Mm -hmm. What is it going to look like for us? Do we have a problem with this personally? Is this mm -hmm. a conviction we have? Is this a conviction they had? What can free our conscience not and we weren't looking for that but we wanted to process through and by going through that again a, a weird illustration by right. going through that though it gave us a confidence as parents to go this is why we're letting our kids do this this is why we're doing it mm -hmm. and and that's why we're gonna we're gonna go forward and then that just trickled as they got older into other areas like sports mm -hmm. we made a decision and this was a family decision but you know how, how much are we going to have our kids involved in sports versus we are very active, obviously, in a church? Where are we going to find that balance? Again, this was something that we had to, you know, we had to walk through and process. So I guess this goes into capacity as a parent to, to grow. I'm trying to grow, not just the way I've always been told, but what, what I feel is right for us. And, you know, our decision came down to we would encourage our kids if they want to do a sport, but we only let them do one sport at a time. Yeah, we did not let them do multiple sports mm -hmm. because we wanted to put a higher priority on other things in life. We wanted to be together at times for family. We wanted to, I mean, you kids I, and and listen, there's no judgment for parents that want to have their kids in seven sports at once. If you want to do that, and you can handle it. That's fine. We didn't have the capacity to do that. Yeah. And so we made that decision so that we would prioritize some things. And so I just think along the journey, and then when we got older. I just remember learning from some other people about their seasons of parenting and realizing that as our kids got into the older years, uh, I remember some advice that we were given. So it's, it's all about like being open to like, I guess, receiving. I got advice that was like, hey, when your parent, when your kids do something at this, you know, they're teenagers or whatever, and it shocks you. It's like, you know, if they said a word that came out of their mouth and you were like, well, how did you learn that? You know what I mean? <laughs> or the music, they're listening, wait, you're listening to whatever. Like, I remember just as somebody who's older and wiser and they go, don't let it shock you. Mm -hmm. Don't react. Don't, the moment you do that, the right. moment you blow up, the moment you do this, that's the moment that they now have a mental little note. Don't do that in front of mom or dad. Mm -hmm. Don't let them see me do this. They're not gonna stop doing it. Mm -hmm. Trust me, I know, I was a teenager, I was a kid, I know. But, you know, and so some of those things really helped us. And so my wife, and I know at different moments, it's like there's moments where it's just like, okay, well, well, let's talk about that. And, you know, inside <laughs> you're going, you did what? <laughs> I will ground you for the, you know, oh, I mean, you know how I gosh. mean? You just want to react I, as a parent. But, but I don't know that we would have had that without literally being open to listening to advice and hearing somebody say that. That was, that was huge for us, and it's yeah. helped us in our relationship with our daughters. I think that's the goal right there is – I, it's hard to grow in your capacity without without people around you and people 
beside you and whether you lead people people underneath you mm -hmm. in your organization who you actually value their opinion mm -hmm. yeah right i think what gets in the way of people increasing capacity to do anything important really is the pride of like you said letting go of the way you've done things right yeah, yeah. because what yeah what right, We've said it multiple times, but what you've done to get to where you are may have worked for a while, right. yeah. but it won't work forever. Right. Yes. And that's true for all of us. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, so who are you actually, like, there's one thing, who, there's, okay, I'll listen to them talk to me about this, but in the back of my mind, I really know what the right thing to do is because I've done it. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's, that's not growing in your capacity. Right. You're not yeah. positioning yourself or posturing yourself and able to be able to grow. Right. You have to really find people that mm -hmm. you like yield your opinion to yeah. and submit your opinion to right. that are all around you. It's mm -hmm. easy to say, oh, well, let me look at my boss who's so much more successful at what this, that's what I want to be doing in 10 years. That's really easy. It's easy to submit mm -hmm. to somebody who's who has arrived the place you want to go. Mm -hmm. Not very easy to submit to just people who are looking at you. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So having the wisdom, why don't you guys talk about that? Having the wisdom, how do you gain the wisdom to surround yourself with people who can be honest with you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and really put yourself in a place where you are in a situation where your capacity can rise. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's a few things. I think number one, for you to grow your capacity, first, you need three things. You need, number one, to actually have a belief that you can grow your capacity. you got to believe there's more in you. Yeah. And you got to, first of, first of all, talk about being surrounded by the right people. Be around people that are for you and can speak that even when you don't believe it. Because there's going to be moments of defeat or failure where you just feel like, man, I am at the end of my rope or I'm at the bottom of the ocean. And you need people that remind you, no, there's more in you. Mm -hmm. You need people on the other side, too, that will even risk offending you and say, no, you're better than that. And there's more in you. Stop settling right. and stop making excuses for your because lack of progress. people who are for you aren't just yes people. Right. Yeah. No. They, they will give you the gift of feedback yep. in the right way. And, and so I think that's part of it. There's got to be a belief there's more in you. Then there's got to actually be a passion to grow it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's, there's got to be, and usually that's, that's, these are buzzwords, but usually the passion to grow it is, is by a purpose. When this is greater than yourself. Like in parenting, the, the, the real reason you'd want to grow your, you'd have a passion to grow your capacity as a parent is because you deep down believe in the purpose mm -hmm. that that's actually a way to love your kids better. Mm -hmm. That if you grow your capacity as a parent, you're going to be able to actually serve your family better. So there's got to be a, a belief, there's got to be um, a passion, and then there's got to be a plan of how to do it. And I think what you said, I, th I think having the right people around you, and I think going a little bit back to our conversation, was it a couple weeks ago when we talked about... Um, uh, skewing our lives in the right things that mm -hmm. we can't we, we, we sometimes we can't have a clean car and get out of it at the same time mm -hmm. but I think it is important to say okay what are the areas I want to grow and then who are the people in that area that I can I like your word yield myself under so for me the person that I might uh, that I might invite to hold me accountable in my spiritual life may not be the same person that I might say hey check out my bank account and right. let me know, based on the plans that I say I have for my finances, what you think when you look at my budget and you look at my spending. I mean, a really funny, a really practical way for this, honestly, going back to the book thing, I told somebody the other day, I said, I feel like I've accidentally, but maybe it's the way I think, I've accidentally um, formed an ensemble of creative of a creative team that's not paid. <laughs> like, you're one of those people. You, there's you and a couple other people that, like, you know, I was off social media for half a year. I don't consider myself innately good at social media. So there's, I, I open my, I have opened myself up for critique and mockery at times <laughs> to say, hey, like, okay, how do I do this? What am I doing that's, uh, how can I better communicate uh, in this format? How can I better communicate in this format? Um, I, I got a, 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 a buddy in, in Raleigh, Logan, that, you know, he's just, he's, Super, he's young and and he's sharp and he makes fun of me about things all the time and it makes me so mad. But it it keeps me, um, it it's, it it makes me better in ways. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think there's certain people. I I think, yeah. you know, we talked about it before, but I love what you said. There, there's 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 ways that I need to have people that are older than me 
that are going to impart wisdom and impart values and impart all these things. And there's other times, and, and younger people can do that too, then there's other ways that you need people around you. Maybe, maybe you need people around you that it's, you don't need to have the, the life goal to be hip or trendy, but you may need to invite some people around you that can make fun of you enough to keep you relevant. Right. right. <laughs> you, you may need to keep some people around you that you can yield to them picking on you enough to say, no, like that, that's something you need to cut out in the way you communicate mm -hmm. or in, yeah. in the way you come across. Um, so I, I think mm -hmm. part of it is just looking at, man, what are the areas of my life? And hopefully we are cultivating diversity of friendships enough and relationships yeah. enough. And, and, uh, and hopefully you're, you know, I, th I think as long as it's a healthy church, a church is a great, one of the things, it's a great community to sharpen yourself in every area of your life. Mm -hmm. Because in a, a healthy local body, there should be people gifted at a million different things mm -hmm. and that have a million different mindsets and a million different capacities. And, you know, again, like I go back to the book example, it's so interesting um, how in when I when I sent it all for my first peer edit, how you and about three other people all I didn't even I wasn't even smart enough to think about it this way at the time, but you all looked at it from very different angles. You were the the theologian that Broke my pride because I just, I knew when I wrote everything is so bold. But you would catch little things like, no, that was actually 36.7 years. I'm like, that, that, that made me so mad, but you were right. So you, you were able to like help cross T's and dot some I's and some theological uh, missteps that I, I didn't realize I'd made or just over -sized. Then there was somebody else that, that um, uh, looked at it from very much more a strategic 30,000 foot view and was, and literally, in very nice words, said, I think your whole book's out of order. The chronology, I actually think, would be better if it was like this. And I looked at it, and I was like, you're right. Mm -hmm. And I actually changed the entire arc and, and, and uh, linear process of how the book laid out. And, and having all those eyes on it of people yeah. that brought different, I don't even know yeah. if I'm, my rambling's helping answer the question at this point. But, yeah, I just I, I think in having the right people around you that um, are far enough ahead to help you in whatever area it is, yeah. But that, that are far enough ahead, A, one, are for you and are not going to crush your spirit and be critical, but also love you to, th to three, speak truth, help you, mm -hmm. give you constructive feedback. Yeah, yeah. And I just think that's invaluable. Yeah, I think some of the most inspiring people that I, I know these days are, are the generation of people who've had to increase their capacity for change. Mm -hmm. Now, there's never been a time... Yep. I mean, this is my perception. There's never been a time to be alive where things have changed so quickly. Yeah. In 20 mm -hmm. years, the way we do yeah. business is different. Mm -hmm. I mean, yep. and, and, and I was talking to my dad the other day, and we were talking about social media and what life was like before it, because I just don't know. Mm -hmm. and so he's like, he was telling me about, you know, how you cared about different things when you were raising kids. You cared about, you just, you didn't mm -hmm. have, you cared about different things in your career. You cared mm -hmm. about yeah. different things. It, you did different things. It, my dad's generation, literally, w you know, they'd read the paper every morning. Yep. And now kids, my, my son's not going to know what that is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that, that's going to be in a history book mm -hmm. for my son. For his, it's, it's wild to think yeah. that. I mean, we are in a time where you have to be so nimble. And, and if you don't, so true. I think having capacity mm -hmm. and growing your capacity is way less of an aspirational goal as much of it as much as it is a necessity yeah. for today's life. That's good. And so, uh, you know, and, and when you've lived through that, you probably come to the table with an understanding that if it's changed this fast, this quick, mm -hmm. it's going to keep changing this fast, yeah. this yeah. quick. Yeah. And if I, I, you know, grandparents who, who are, will learn an iPhone so they can communicate with their grandchildren. Yep. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, what did we do in 2020? We all learned how to use Zoom and yeah. do remote everything yep. right uh you know uh, older generations learned how to do grocery delivery mm -hmm. i mean there's a there's an element of capacity that mm -hmm. that life will beg of you mm -hmm. if you sit around too I like, long i like the point of necessity it just made me think of um, my father-in-law when he was he was working in con construction as a vp for a company and um he, he's he's retired now but he was telling me like the last five or ten years i can't remember and we know the owner he goes to our church but um, you're talking about a company, very, very successful, multiple companies, you know, it's done, done great things. That's probably the largest concrete company in central Ohio, all this stuff. 
but when you would when he would talk he would talk about them having to constantly reinvent themselves this is the leadership of mm -hmm. that organization and one of the big things that they did i mean they would bring in leadership experts to come in and all their managers and leaders and have leadership training like once a week or so often they uh, did they did assessments eq emotional like what is your emotional intelligence they're they're training people on it that was a little bit out of necessity and i remember uh, I'm talking about, we talked about the generational gap. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that they did was they, they brought people in to really talk about what does it mean to lead this generation, this latest mm -hmm. generation where they, they mm -hmm. want different things. Mm -hmm. Where it used to be before, hey, just come show up and work, you get a paycheck. Mm -hmm. And now it's like, well, no, do I need to work five days a week? Mm -hmm. Can I come in at nine? Mm -hmm. What if I do this? Can I get off for lunch for this? You know what I mean? All, all the things that kind of the younger generation is looking <laughs> for and, and wanting and that was, didn't, it didn't exist when the older generations are sitting there and came up in the business. Right. And so I, I, I just thought it was pretty incredible to see most of them old, you know, whether in their 50s or 60s, really taken very seriously. They need to change their capacity to how they lead. Yeah. And there's no getting around it when you realize that at that, that time, it was the millennial generation, mm -hmm. was at that time the largest portion of the workforce. Mm -hmm. So you can sit around and resist it all day long, but eventually you're going to get passed by. Mm -hmm. And if you do not increase your capacity, I think it is a great point, whatever area of your life, if you do not increase your capacity, you will get passed by. Mm -hmm. I yep. want you just to think about that for a moment. Mm -hmm. You sitting at your job, you don't increase your capacity, but your coworkers are, mm -hmm. guess who's getting promoted? Mm -hmm. You're gonna get passed by, you're gonna get passed by. Right. You can look at it from parenting standpoint. You don't increase your capacity, your kids are gonna get really smart and get by you <laughs> on what they need to get by with you. You know, Finsta and all this other stuff that happened. Like, if you don't, if you don't raise your level, and I think the same is true, a big area is emotional intelligence. Yeah. If you don't raise your mm -hmm. emotional intelligence yeah. at work, if you are not, again, I go back to this word, I think it is the number one lid mm -hmm. for any of us, our capacity is our, is our self-awareness, mm -hmm. our mm -hmm. lack of self-awareness. and. I will say to, to what you said about feedback and you're talking about having people around you. And I think this is something really important to remember. Um, people, unless the environment really demands or calls for it, people will not traditionally offer up feedback unless it is requested. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, you, you sit around and we, well, you know, people can help us grow our capacity and they can. You have to be the one to initiate and go, hey, is there anything that you see in me or my job or mm -hmm. what I'm doing that you think I could be doing better? Yeah. You have to initiate that conversation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I don't think we do by default. Yeah. Why? Because most of us, and I've this, don't want to know. Yeah. I don't want to hear what you actually feel and what you yeah. think. But that's the way you get better. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The way you get better is by getting honest by like getting humble yeah. and going, how can I get better at whatever this is? Saying, yeah. I need to become a better parent. Or how about this one? I need to become a better husband. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? I mean, we could just go through life and we can just do marriage mm -hmm. and we can just, I don't know, it is what it is. Or you actually work on yourself yeah. and you, you get better. That's why, like here in our context coming up in the month of September, we've got an inspired conference for women. Mm -hmm. You know, I think the people that, lean into those things are the ones that end up developing and getting better. And guess what? Their relationships get better and their mm -hmm. parenting gets better. Mm -hmm. and they become better employees and better employers mm -hmm. and, and, and everything around them grows. Your capacity grows, everything around you will grow. Yeah. And I just think it's, I think it is more critical. I don't think we think about it enough. Mm -hmm. It was challenging because I didn't think about it. Someone's mm -hmm. sitting here going, what do you wish everybody knew? And just when I thought about it, I was like, it is on each of us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It is your responsibility. Either you grow your capacity or you will get passed by. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a great place to end it. Mm -hmm. I think, um, you know, uh, I I think that instead, uh, hopefully through this conversation, you you understand it. It's not something that's meant to exhaust you. No. Mm -hmm. Don't just sit and, and feel like you have to read ten books on this or that. That would help, you know. But it's it's the intention of growing your capacity isn't to exhaust you. It's mm -hmm. actually to to help energize you mm -hmm. yeah. towards what fuels you, towards your passions, towards your purposes in what's most important in your life. And yeah. so lean in. And understand that it's required of you, so dive into it to exist in the world today and to lead in your context, your family, your 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 workplace, your school, whatever that is, um, that, that people around you are going to benefit 
from you yeah. growing and taking steps to yeah. grow your capacity to love, to lead, to challenge, mm-hmm. to give, all sorts of things. So we're just so thankful that, that you are with us, and we would love for you to share this conversation with somebody who maybe you just want to encourage them, empower them, inspire them. Maybe you have a, a, a team at your workplace. We'd love for you to share this conversation with them as well. And as always, thanks to everybody who likes and shares and, and hits the like button on YouTube, subscribes hit to it. our YouTube account. Just hit, say hit it. it. I, I really hit just like want button. you to hit every button and just type something nice. So <laughs> and we love you all. We just thank you for being with us every week. See you next time.